We're going to finally get over to the right side of the heart now. So uh, our next talk is going to be by Dr. Uh, Kosarek, and it's going to be on tricuspid valve and pulmonary valve disease. The forgotten valves. Always going to take a back seat to the mitral and the aortic, but that's fine. That's the way it should be. Uh, so tricuspid and pulmonic valve disease, this is kind of an outline of what we'll go through. Uh, just briefly, the anatomy of both valves, the causes of TR, evaluating and grading TR. We'll go over briefly uh, tricuspid repair. Uh, we'll skim over the very rare lesions that affect these valves, and then we'll talk about estimating PA pressures with both the tricuspid and, and pulmonic. So both valves have three leaflets. Tricuspid's got septal, anterior, posterior, pulmonic, uh, uh, anterior, left and right. Uh, of note, the tricuspid annulus is the largest annulus, so you'll get the lowest flows through it. Uh, another anatomic tidbit is that the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve attaches just slightly more apically on the interventricular septum than the mitral does. So this uh, table represents a host of the most common etiologies for tricuspid regurg. It's pulled from the ASC guidelines on valve regurgitation. Uh, you can see they have it broken down in a primary leaflet of etiologies of TR that are from a primary leaflet abnormality versus TR that's from a secondary or functional uh, cause. So functional TR is far and away the most common variety of TR that you're going to see. Something like 80% of the TR that we see is from some functional disease. And that's no surprise when you look at the disease processes that can cause it. These are all going to be in your wheelhouse. Left heart disease, valve disease, RV dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, you're going to see that the rest of your career. And in fact, uh, those patients who present for mitral surgery, 30 to 40 percent of them are going to have a significant amount of TR. So enough TR to maybe intervene on. So I have a few examples of both secondary and primary causes of TR. On the right here is a patient who has uh, RV dysfunction. This is that same patient who had that kink in the RCA. So this is right as the problem is starting, and you can see the RV is still moving pretty well, but the TR and the atrial septum are what really uh, identified this early. So uh, severe TR from RV dysfunction there. On the left is a person with, uh, uh, again, the same patient with primary pulmonary hypertension. Both of these are examples of severe functional TR. Then I have a few examples of different TR from a primary leaflet abnormality. This is the patient who has endocarditis of the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve uh, and also a flail leaflet due to that Goomba on the anterior leaflet. Uh, so the left view is sort of uh, approaching a metasophageal four chamber and I guess it's important to point out here that in the metasophageal four chamber, the leaflet that's near the septum is, surprise, the septal leaflet and most commonly the other leaflet in a metasophageal four chamber is usually the anterior leaflet just like here. And then an RV inflow outflow, which is on the right side of the screen, uh, the leaflet that's furthest to the left is usually the posterior leaflet. So that's how you can kind of identify those in the metasophageal we use. You can also appreciate that that flow leaflet and the RV inflow outflow, you can just, just see a big hole where, there, where there's no valve coaptation. This is a great example of carcinoid disease. So carcinoid disease is typically a right-sided valvular disease because it's uh, from an excess of serotonin. Now, it could affect the left side if there's an intracardiac shunt. Uh, but the reason this is a great example is it uh, shows clearly on the left side, you see the short, thick, and restricted leaflets, which is common for carcinoid. Um, and then on the right side, you see how severe the TR is. And the TR here is so, is so severe, in fact, the hole is so big that the RV there's really not a lot of high flow going through it. It's like instead of uh, pinching off the end of a hose, you made those bigger. So there's more flow going through it, but the velocity is not as high. And this can sometimes be a little tricky uh, to pick up. So the flow is almost laminar going backwards. It's so much of it. Uh, this is another example of a primary leaflet abnormality um, that is uh, from a congenital cause. And it's, it's, it's rare, but it's specific to the tricuspid, so it's worth a mention. It's called Epstein's anomaly. Uh, Epstein's anomaly is where the septal leaflet, at least the septal leaflet, attaches very apically uh, in the heart. And so you have a couple sort of buzz words or phrases that go along with Epstein's, and the first one is atrialization of the right ventricle. So normally, uh, all that part of the RV, uh, or all this part of the heart, right... Here should be the right ventricle, but the valve leaflet attaches so much, uh, so apically that it becomes atrium, so you have atrialization of the right ventricle. 
The other buzz uh, word or phrase that comes with this is a sail-like or curtain-like anterior leaflet because the anterior leaflet still has its regular attachment point. And so in order to co-apt with the septal leaflet, it's got to be really long and go all the way down to the apex so it looks like a sail or a curtain. These are the ways in which we grade uh, TR. This is all also pulled from the AC guidelines and valve regurgitation. You can see there's a host of them, and I even added another one. And that's because I feel like that's very useful for making a case if you think there should be one made for uh, intervening on the tricuspid such as with the tricuspid repair and that. So the thing I added was to actually measure the annulus of the tricuspid or measure the base of the right heart. And four is a nice, easy cutoff to remember. I believe the, the, the actual cutoff of the guidelines recommend are 4.1 at the base of the RV. Uh, so to go ahead and measure the tricuspid annulus, because you see they have uh, that the RV would be dilated in the case of severe TR, but this puts a number on it. There are certainly other ways. The quantifiable ways that we typically use that are uh, easy to do would be a vena contracta, uh, similar like you do on the aortic regurge or mitral regurge. Uh, you basically measure the thinnest part of the biggest jet, kind of the neck of the biggest jet. The cutoff for severe would be 0.7, so this is the patient who has vena contracta 0.9. Certainly you could do things like a PISA on a TR jet. This is from a transgastric RV inflow view, which is why the PISA hemisphere is kind of coming up towards the probe. Uh, nothing wrong with doing it this way. I'd say it's less often done with the tricuspid regurg, mainly because you don't always get such a clean hemisphere. And frankly, I've never, I've never convinced a surgeon with a PISA. Never gotten a surgeon excited about, hey, look at this PISA. But the dilated annulus they'll respond to. Um, so I'd say the, the common quantifiable ways we do TR are all listed here. The vena contracta, occasionally we'll trace the jet area. And either the, it's the area uh, in and of itself, which would be 10 uh, centimeters squared, would be the cutoff for severe, or a measure of the uh, tricuspid jet relative to the whole right atrium. And usually over, if it's over 50% of the area of the right atrium, that would be severe. So vena contracted jet area, and the last one is uh, flow reversal in the hepatic vein, which we use pretty commonly. Um, so this would be a normal tracing for hepatic vein flow, uh, spectral Doppler tracing with pulse wave uh, in a hepatic vein. Basically, during systole and diastole, you'd expect flow towards the probe or into the atrium, similar to pulmonary vein flow, um, and that's important to remember. There's a little bit of backflow that occurs when the atrium contracts. That makes sense. And this little V wave sometimes comes up whenever uh, there's overfilling of the right atrium. You don't always see that, but that, that happens from time to time. The important thing to remember is that during systole, flow should be going towards the probe and into the atrium. These are three different examples of three different patients who have severe TR from different etiologies. You can see the bottom left there, there's just rip roar and systolic flow reversal. It's important you have EKG on there to compare your cardiac cycle to uh, the spectral Doppler tracing. And so they all look a little bit different, but they essentially give you the same thing. And I found that uh, when you put pulse wave in the hepatic vein and there's flow reversal, you also know that it's kind of ratty looking. I mean, this one's pretty smooth, uh, but most of the time it's got this irregular kind of uh, tracing. And that, so that would be an indicator of severe TR as well. So now that you know the patient has TR, uh, the question becomes, how do you, what do you do about it and when do you do something about it? So tricuspid repair, thankfully, rather than replacement, is, is usually the thing that works best. And, and thankfully, it, it, it will almost always work even when the annulus is very dilated and the TR is very severe, provided that it's from a functional TR, which again is the most common. Um, most common way we repair uh, TR would be with a band, sort of an incomplete ring, which you see there, uh, right here. And then this is a 3D example of our tricuspid that's been repaired. Uh, the nice thing about a band is that because that the open end of it is where the conduction system is, so you usually avoid the AV node and there's not as many conduction abnormalities after it's been repaired. Other options for repair would be, uh, under the letter C there would be a DeVega repair, DeVega suture, where it's just a running stitch around the whole annulus that stinches, uh, cinches it down. And lastly, the, another option would be what's called a bicuspidization of the tricuspid, where a mattress suture is placed at the commissure and it's cinched down that way. Another thing that's nice about the tricuspid repair is that can be done with the aortic cross clamp off with the heart beating. So you allow for some de-airing and some reperfusion while the surgeon does the repair. Uh, but the big question that's still yet to be answered, we're still trying to answer, is when we should be doing this. So if you have a patient with a dilated annulus and severe TR, that's, pretty, that's a pretty easy uh, case to make. 
But it turns out that patients, even patients who have a moderate degree of TR do worse. And uh, this, is, this study was done, uh, this isn't specific to perioperative patients, but uh, suffice to say uh, all the perioperative data has shown something similar. So patients who come in and have moderate TR uh, end up doing worse than those who don't. But the, and that's, uh, uh, regardless of what the EF is and regardless of what the PA pressures are. The question that we're still trying to answer though is should we re be repairing everyone? So if everyone who has moderate TR does worse, should everyone get a tricuspid ring? And the, we still don't really know. I'll just say that uh, the pendulum is sort of swinging currently to being more aggressive with, uh, with treating TR. So on to the rare causes, uh, the rare uh, disease processes for these valves, tricuspid stenosis. Most common cause would be rheumatic disease. It usually, when it does occur, it usually occurs with left-sided valve disease as well. Carcinoid can do it. Certainly some congenital abnormalities, or sometimes just a big mass can do it. So if you have a big mass lesion on the tricuspid like here, this would be a malignant, malignant carcinoma on this patient. Uh, it can just cause obstruction of flow. I found that knowing the criteria for tricuspid stenosis, though, has come in handy more often when you're trying to assess a valve that's been repaired to see if, t uh, if uh, tricuspid stenosis has been caused by the repair. And so the criteria we use would be, uh, because the annulus is so big, under normal circumstances, the flows through it or the, or the velocities through it rarely exceed uh, 0.7 meters per second. Uh, peak velocity over 1.5 would be indicative of severe TR or a mean gradient over 5. Pulmonic regurg uh, turns out to be very common. So this little whiff of pulmonic regurg you can see here on an RV inflow outflow occurs in up to 75% of people. If you ever care to put color on the pulmonic valve, you'll probably see it. Uh, if you have significant PR though, you should, uh, it should sort of spark you to uh, evaluate the RVOT, the PA, the pulmonary branches, see if those are dilated. But usually when we have a patient who has significant PR, we know about it ahead of time because it is, in most circumstances after a patient who has had congenital heart uh, surgeries. And, and basically it would be a patient who was born with tetralogy of Fallot or pulmonary atresia. And sometimes the way they treat that is just to core out all that obstruction and leave it wide open. So this would be an example of that. This patient was born with pulmonary atresia and they just left the valve wide open and they uh, lived without a pulmonic valve for until they were an adult. Pulmonic valve is useless apparently. Um, so. As you can see here in the color flow, it's just the blood is just kind of sloshing back and forth. And you put continuous wave Doppler on there, you get kind of a sine wave pattern of blood just going back and forth until they put a tissue valve in there and suddenly it's uh, completely competent. So this is before and after. These are the criteria we use to grade pulmonic regurg. Again, this isn't going to come up a whole lot for you. Uh, just know that it exists and they're there and you can look them up. Uh, this probably is not going to affect your day to day. Uh, but you'll note that a lot of these Criteria are the same ones we use for AI. We just apply them to the pulmonic valve. Pulmonic stenosis is also very rare, almost always a congenital problem. Um, it can occur with carcinoid disease. That would be the most common acquired case. And again, you can see the criteria we use there for grading it. Um, very similar to aortic stenosis in terms of grading it. So last thing I'm going to talk about ways we can estimate RV pressure and PA pressure using uh, the tricuspid pulmonic. So if you have a tri uh, tricuspid regurgitation jet uh, and you have good alignment with your ultrasound beam, which, which can often be achieved in what's called a, a modified by cable view, uh, certainly it just depends on the direction of the jet, uh, but uh, most of the views you'd be familiar with for evaluating the right heart, you can also use to evaluate the tricuspid, obviously, so metasophageal four chamber, RV inflow outflow, transgastric inflow. Modified bicable is a bit specific to tricuspid because uh, when you're in a bicable view, if you just slightly turn to the left, the tricuspid valve will come into view kind of at the bottom of the screen. And again, if you have trouble getting your tricuspid jet to line up with the ultrasound beam, that's a good view to go with. So once you got it lined up, you put continuous wave Doppler through the tricuspid jet, and you can then measure the velocity. And from the velocity using the simplified Bernoulli equation, which we've heard about, you can calculate or have the machine calculate for you a peak gradient. And once you have a peak gradient between two chambers, if you know the pressure of one of those chambers, you can solve for the other one. And that's something that can be applied to any two chambers where there's a gradient, uh, but it's most often applied clinically here for a TR jet. So we have a gradient between the RV and the RA. We know what the RA pressure is because that's CVP. 
and so we add the CVP to the peak gradient, and that gives you your RV systolic pressure. And we can assume that the RV pressure is the PA pressure, provided there's no obstruction of flow, RVOT obstruction, or, or pulmonic stenosis, which they almost never is. Uh, so that's pretty simple to do, and, and it turns out to be very highly accurate. And, and um, if you have a PA catheter in place, just go ahead and do it, and you'll see that you, if your TR jet lines up well enough, you'll, you'll be kind of on the money most of the time. And this is just another example of the same thing with the computer doing all the math for us. Turns out we can also estimate PA pressures by using the pulmonic valve with something called PAAT, or pulmonary artery acceleration time. So again, you gotta get good alignment of the blood flow with your ultrasound beam. And so you're looking for blood flow out of the pulmonic valve, which uh, that can be lined up accurately uh, oftentimes in what's called an upper esophageal aortic arch short axis where the PA comes to, into view here on the left side of the screen. You can also do it from the so-called pants view where you're in the ascending uh, aorta short axis, mid esophageal ascending short axis, and the PA looks like a pair of pants. Just wherever you can get blood flow to line up with your probe, that's where you want to stay. Put the pulse wave sample volume right at the pulmonic annulus, and then you'll get a spectral Doppler tracing that looks like that, and that's just flow out of the PA. And what you're looking for there is the time from the start of ejection to peak velocity. And that time, the time it takes from start to finish, or rather from start to peak velocity, that tells you something about what your PA pressures are. Now, it's not quite as accurate or on the money as the TR jet uh, method, but it's more of a rough estimate. Um, so this little uh, table or graph here with all the dots on it, that was pulled from a study that compared PA, PA pressures to PAT. And you can see a PAT right around 100 correlates to something around 50, maybe a little a PA pressure of 50 or maybe less. So I feel like those are, even though it's not dead on, it's uh, easy to remember. A PAT of 100, PA systolic of 50. So uh, the rough estimates I kind of use is, if the PAT is greater than 110, you can be pretty well assured that the PA pressure is uh, less than 40 probably. And if the PAT is less than 90, then there's a good chance that your PAs are 50 or higher. Even just the shape of these spectral uh, Doppler tracings, the waves that are formed by the uh, pulse wave spectral Doppler tracing will give you some indication of what the PA pressures will be. So this is kind of rounded looking uh, shape, which would indicate that the time of the PAT is a little bit longer and the PA pressure would be normal. I'm trying to move on here a little bit, let's see. There we go, so this is again just a normal sort of tracing. You see we've got a PAT of 211, which can indicate no, low to normal PA pressures. And this would be in a patient who has uh, pulmonary hypertension or RV dysfunction, and their PAT is 80, so uh, higher PA pressures. And you can see the shape of it is kind of like a steep triangle. That's it.